Hi, everyone. It's Wami Taff, founder of Career Safari and host of the Career Safari podcast. Season two is finally here. I have popped champagne about this day. I'm so excited to bring this to you. We have a whole new group of torchbearers coming your way. And if you're watching me, then you know we are now on YouTube. Yep, that's right. With this season came a little bit of a change that we are now a YouTube channel. So you can catch each episode in its entirety. So not just what you hear on the podcast, but more on our YouTube channel, Career Safari. It's the same great stuff. Let's let everybody know we're sharing stories of women from around the world that are taking risk, betting on themselves, and breaking barriers every single day to give us the inspiration we need for our work day or our school day. Welcome back. Enjoy our first episode of season two. Subscribe, share, leave comments. So excited to hear from you. Let's continue to pass the torch. What did you name your career safari journey? The Fabulous Adventures of the Wildress Woman. The Fabulous Adventures of the Wildress Woman? Well-dressed. Well-dressed woman? Okay. And this is why we have to come prepared to talk to you, Tiffany. (laughs) Yes, that's what I've decided on, just. Um, I feel like fabulous is always a word that I'm using and I feel like it's always been a word to kind of describe me even as a a little person. So I've always been known for just someone that's doing the most. My name has always been attached to it. I'm dramatic. I can be over the top. And for some people, I may be too much, but that's okay. We'll talk about that too much. And if it's really too much or just too much for them. There's a difference. Some people are not enough. Yeah. Oop, oop. Don't do this to me so early on in this podcast. Welcome to the Career Safari Podcast, our space to have candid conversations with women from around the world about their unique career journeys, because there are women everywhere carrying the torch for us so we can boldly be on our own path. And I'm your host, Wamita. It's a new month, and I am delighted to introduce this month's torchbearer. We're talking to a multifaceted woman. And we can thank the fact that she was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan for that. She is a Black Detroiter with her doctorate in educational leadership and management. She uses all of that knowledge for the greater good by providing technical assistance and training to special education leaders in Washington, D.C. public school systems, which is a place I hold close to my heart. She's also Madame Policy and Fashion herself. She created her own platform called Policy and Fashion which is to share career and fashion advice as well as inspiration to women. And I must admit, I am a consumer of her content. I fully look at policy and fashion (laughs) for um, fashion ideas and inspiration. And this month's torchbearer is Dr. Tiffany Ingram. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited for this conversation. I am too. Uh, Welcome to the Career Safari Podcast. Welcome to the space. We're here to celebrate you this month. And you know, I had to come dressed up for you. I was like, Tiffany's coming. Like, take out those sweatpants, put them away, put on something a little bit more decent for her, please. No, it's okay. I want you to come as you are. But I do feel like there is something you said about getting dressed up every day. I just feel like it makes you feel better when you're putting on an outfit that you're like, I thoughtfully put this together um, and being able, even if you're sitting in your house. So it, it just makes you feel better overall. It does. It does. And I remember at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, when I was like, we were all trying to figure out, is this a temporary thing or not? My, like, I looked at myself like every day getting more and more like, terrible looking in the zoom meetings. And there was one zoom meeting that I popped on, um, with like a hoodie and like my hair was still in braids. And I was like, girl, (laughs) 
Once you put down in that square, you're like, dang, is that? Oh me? my god! And then I was like, right after that, I happened to watch a some Zoom, like you know, one of those Zoom like award shows or something that Kelly Rowland was on. And that woman, I mean, she's just like a walking, like magical being. But I saw her and I'm like, if Kelly, like, dang, Kelly, you look great. I'm like, girl, I need to step this up and he's so me. Yeah, because I think it's so, you can get so relaxed. Like, oh, I'm just at home. But then it's yeah. like, you don't know, like you are leading presentations. You're having meetings with people at all different levels in your organization. And you do need to look like you care. Um, and I'm not saying you have to do full face of makeup every day and you need to be contoured and highlighted, but I, one of my like go-to things is like, okay, I get dressed and I put on my sunscreen and mm. the glow screen by super goop just gives you this shine that makes it look like you have on makeup, but you still look kind of put together. And then I draw on my eyebrows and that's my look for the day. Okay, you guys, we're going to get a lot of these tips. Don't worry, I got you covered on the questions that we have for today. Because <laughs> I'm thinking sunscreen, eyebrows. Okay, I've just gotten good at putting on a little bit of a lip, but I'm like, those are extra tips I didn't think about. <laughs> yeah, you can do a lip, but you know, sometimes you want your skin to look brighter because on these yeah. zooms, you can look really dull if you don't watch it. Um, and then where people's offices are in their house, your lighting may not be the best. So you need to glow a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's, my stable that's how I've been living these past two years okay just from that you know what's headed to you for this interview but let's get into like this journey um because now we see you as this this doctor and this professional and this fabulous um person that's just all over our instagrams and all over our world but you called yourself in our pre-interview a black detroiter and I was like okay okay so these men, so what I'm like deducing from that is those Midwest roots are important to you. So you talked about being from the Midwest, that Midwest work ethic being foundational to who you are. So what's so important about that for you? I mean, I will say from the beginning of time, oh, Detroit people always know how to dress. So we come, if you ever come to Detroit, you will see people dip and die like, their glasses match their shirt, match their hat, like pants, boots all together, match their purse. Um, and I just knew early on, I never forget my grandfather was always like, when you go outside, you don't just represent yourself, you represent our whole family. Huh. So it was very big on like, you need to look put together. Um, and you can hear, you'll hear older Black people say, well, don't go out there thinking we don't have, you know, a, a good home environment, you know, keep yourself up, you keep yourself together. And I will say that, you know, we were always now, while I didn't have much growing up, we always look very put together. So um, fashion was always something that was super important to me. And then the origins of being a Detroiter, I just feel like there's no other place in the world that breeds these type of people with the mm. resilience and um, the level of tenacity that we have to just like overcome so much. And I think when you live in an environment where so many people make so many assumptions about you, um, there's so many stereotypes about what it means to be from Detroit. So then it's like, oh, you live in the projects. Oh, you live in the ghetto. Um, and I didn't live like that. Um, but I wasn't the most wealthiest person, but we weren't the poorest. And I think that the hard work and tenacity that comes out of Detroit, we really do hustle harder because people always discount us out so early on. It's like, no, we can do it. Um, and we can make things happen. So uh, I'm always going to be a Detroiter at heart because I just feel like that's the foundation of who I am. Like my family is still in Detroit, like literally in Detroit city limits. I know a lot of people you would talk to, they live in the suburbs. Like my mother is still Detroit city limits, Detroit taxpayer, and she's lived there her entire life. We are born and bred Detroiters. Detroit proper. You are a Detroit per proper. Detroiter proper. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's what some people, you're like, oh, you're from Detroit. Then people will start when they realize I'm from Detroit, then they'll start backing up like, oh, well, I'm from Metro Detroit. I'm not really from, because it's a really big thing. Like you cannot claim it if you are not from there. Oh my goodness. So if I, if you were talking to like a person that is sitting in, 
a Kragana. And they're like, uh, you know, I've heard of Detroit, you know, cars and Eminem and like the Lions or whatever, the Pistons. I mean, those are some of like the, the, the symbols of and the cultural symbols of Detroit. But like in the United States, Detroit played such an essential role to the Industrial Revolution that led us to where we are today. Like, so how would you explain like what's so important about Detroit for for you? Um, I just think it goes, it's twofold. Like, I feel like the Black Detroit experience is very unique as many of, um, I will say for Black people in America, once the Industrial Revolution kind of took off and those auto plants were booming, it was our grandfathers, our great grandfathers that were able to migrate to areas like Detroit and Chicago also to get quality jobs working at the plant. So that is something that um, Henry Ford and those other early um, automobile leaders gave the opportunity. They were willing to hire black people um, and you were yep. willing to get a decent pay, like you were going to get a decent pay. Now, granted, yep. it wasn't equal pay. Um, to the white men who were working on the job, but you were getting paid more than the jobs that they were offering in the in the South. So Detroit pay, you know, kind of paves the way of building this middle class America for Black people because um, it was one of the locations where you could honestly get a job and make an honest living. And from there, many of like the older Detroiters, they had multiple homes. They were able to um, kind of gain this traction in, of trying to achieve this American dream that has often been so promised to us as Black people. Um, and I think Detroit is one of those spots that were the early leaders in all of that. Um, in addition, like it's a beautiful place. Um, very early on, like 1920s and 30s, people would go to vacation in Detroit because we're right on the waterfront. Um, we're right literally across the river from Canada. So you will look over and it's like, oh, that's the Detroit River, but that's the Canadian side, You're looking over into Windsor. Um, and you just get a very different lived experience where my vacation, sometimes we would go to Toronto for a vacation. Sometimes we would go to Chicago, right? Because it's almost like equal distant. Um, so the accessibility to be international, so to speak, um, is another play in Detroit that I think is pretty dope that you don't see in a lot of other cities in America. Um, and then I would just say our architecture, the cars, like, understanding the automobile like we were at the epicenter of that yeah um but then also in black history we were one of the final stops in the underground railroad so there's a lot of rich history of um black people going over to canada to seek their freedom and you know kind of escaping the u.s and detroit being one of those final stops for people um it's really dope to understand like how history folds into this place. So I, I am like a diehard Detroiter. You can't even talk about the music influence and talking about Motown. This is like the foundations of rock and roll and um, kind of like- American pop culture. American pop culture, honestly, because everything has sampled off of somebody that was kind of going through who's in that Motown kind of records. Um, so you start thinking about Michael Jackson, Aretha Franklin, the Supreme, Smokey Robinson, like all of those people have such a rich um, presence um, in Detroit. And while they may not still live there, I didn't live there when they, when they died, but maybe Aretha did, but yeah. they have such a big influence on the culture. Music is huge there as well. So it's beyond Eminem. Um, I feel like we are like the foundation of a lot of um, American culture. You better let them know. You better let them know. I better go visit. Now the I weather, know. It's not that great. The weather is not that great. But to go visit them between May and September is a good time. I mean, I think if anyone here is listening that is a part of like the Detroit Travel Board, I think you found one of your ambassadors. You can find her at Policy and Fashion. <laughs> Yes. But you really, it, it, I wanted to make it clear, like the, how impactful um, being from that part of the United States is for people who don't know, and also just your work ethic, because 
there really is when I think like think about what we talked about, there really is a through line and like you're willing to shake up some tables. And my, my assumption, obviously I'm not a psychologist is like a lot of that is attributed to um, coming from Detroit. And you also talked about your, like your grandfather. Um, do you want like him being like a sharecropper coming to Detroit? Yeah. yeah like my, my grandmother, I will say that she was born in Yazoo city, Mississippi. Um, so that is like it, Mississippi Delta, like for real back alley woods type place and my grandfather was from Memphis and they made their trek up to Detroit so um for my grandfather to work at the plant now yes I talk good things about the plant that they're saying oh you know you can get paid well but it was also very dangerous Mm -hmm. um because at that point it was no standard you're just cranking out stuff you're building all this stuff um they didn't necessarily have all these great protections in the plant so you would see a lot of our elders you would look some of their fingers were kind of like nipped off and stuff like because they worked at the plant um wow. and um it wasn't the most danger it wasn't the most glorious place to work it was actually very dangerous um very early on but um my grandmother you know didn't really have the opportunity to go to school so me getting my doctorate is like something that is truly when Maya Angelou says I am the product of my ancestors wildest dreams like that really truly is it for me because she didn't go beyond like a fifth grade education. When you work in the South, when you live in the South, they were, you were a farmer, you were a sharecropper, you were helping your family pick cotton, do all these other things. You were a farmer. Um, So you didn't really get to go to school. Um, And if you did go to school, it was miles away. Um, So she always talked about, oh, I walked all these miles to go to school. And I mean, we'd be like, what? Like, we couldn't believe it. But it was very true. The opportunity to go to school just was not there for Black people. Um, And Black women got married much earlier, started producing kids much earlier. So you didn't get that opportunity, build a career. What's that? Like you, if you made money, you made money watching people's kids cooking or maybe being a seamstress, like sewing people's clothes and stuff. So it wasn't like, oh, I have this big fancy career. So I think my my family history and like where I am right now, I know this is something that they would have never dreamed, Um, but they always instill education. You wouldn't, they probably wouldn't thought that I could have done this. Like the opportunity would be there for me, but um, it is truly a, a huge full circle moment of looking at my family tree and how far I've been able to go. And I know a lot of people resonate with that. Like, no, I mean, no matter where you come from, whether you're like a first generation in a country, whether you are the first one to um, graduate any level of education. Um, so there's a lot of people that resonate with coming and like being the first of. But what impact? I mean, you had you had a lot of decisions you could have made about where you wanted to focus your career. What impacted your decision to get into education and then focus on students with disability? Um, I feel like education was always something, it kind of was piquing my interest a while ago, but it, even before undergrad, but I'm like, no, I don't want to be a teacher. Um, and then I'm like, oh, graduated, ended up going to go be a teacher. Um, I, I think education has just played such a pivotal um, role in my life. And I cannot say where I would be without education. Um, I truly think that it is the one factor that can single-handedly change outcomes for people. Um, Whether it is degrees, whether it's certification, your education, your knowledge, what you know, what skills you have um, can change your trajectory in life. And I think that my work that I've done in DC around students with disabilities and ensuring they're getting access to the services they need And even some of the work now talking about preparing for them post-secondary is critical. We can't just keep uh, ignoring the fact that parts of our education system is broken and needs it needs work um, because these are humans that are going to be your future neighbors and hopefully the future doctors, lawyers, nurses, business owners. And we need to treat our kids as such like they have this potential to continue to advance our community and our, our, our race, our culture, all of that. 
Um, and I think it's really important that they get quality opportunities to do that. Wait, let's just go back a little bit. Why did, were you avoiding being a teacher? What was that about? <laughs> I mean, I'm avoiding it because, right, like you start thinking about how much money they make. So I have always mm. been a very person like I don't want to be poor. Um, and you people will hear that people who know me will say that like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be poor. And while it is an honorable profession, it is not the profession that you are going to get rich in. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think for me, uh, I was always like, well, I don't know how much I'm how I'm going to make money with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think for me and then in Michigan, it's extremely the process to become a teacher. Oh. It's like a five-year program in undergrad. You still have to come out, do one a year full of, for your internship, and then still take a standardized exam, even after right college. Like that's what gets you certified to actually work in the school district. And um, I just was like, that's a lot of work to not make a lot of money. So I'm like, oh, I need to find another way to do this. Um, or maybe I don't want to do that. For a second, I thought I was going to be an attorney. Um, I had, you know, all type of lofty goals, but the space that I found myself in, in this education policy compliance space, um, where I'm leveraging my experiences working in the classroom, working with families has really created this space for me to try to inform some actual policy and change at, um, our state level here in DC, uh, to ensure students have what they need, but, also acknowledging the challenges that teachers and administrators face in the classroom and in the school setting as well. So how did you carve out that unique space for yourself? I know you spent some time in the classroom and then you decided not to, I mean, so just walk me through like what, how'd you find this space? Oh yeah. So I came out here, I taught, then I was like, oh, this seems, it's not, the best fit for me. Teaching wasn't the best fit, but I liked kids and I liked working with families. Um, And then I was like, okay, well, how can I leverage that? Um, I saw a job posting online at that time. DC was in a lot of trouble, class action lawsuit Mm -hmm. around uh, special education services and they needed compliance case managers. So essentially all I did was like, okay, I think I want this job. Because at that time, I was like, oh, maybe I'll go to law school. This will maybe leverage me into that. Um, Because you work directly with the general counsel um, in the school district. And I just spent my time talking to families, talking to attorneys, and talking to school teams. And I just found my work so interesting because every day was a different day. Sometimes it was wild and crazy. Um, And But sometimes you could really feel like, okay, we are making some levers of change here. Students are getting what they need, whether... It was just one student at a time, but you still felt like some type of impact. Um, So I did that for probably about two or three years. Um, And then another position opened up where I was working directly alongside school teams and trying to advise them on the challenges that they were facing with some of their special education students. So it's a continuum of services. Some students need more. Um, and a more restrictive setting where it's a smaller class size and some students can be in general education and really trying to challenge people's mindsets around what we think our kids can do. And I think it is very interesting, um, even people in education that sometimes kind of count out our students, particularly our students of color, about what they think they're able to do. Um, and really trying to push and trying to challenge our kids to learn more, to get more skills. And people are so quick to say what they, oh, we don't think he can do it. But it's like, did we try it before we say he needs something totally on the opposite end of the spectrum? So um, I enjoy my work there. And I think there is something to say um, about your parent being an advocate for you. And I think yeah. Um, if that anything I could take away from my experience is that parents are your, you are your best advocate for your child. And we need to make sure we're building little humans that know how to advocate for themselves as well. Um, regardless of what their needs may be, but being able to speak up for yourself and say, Hey, I need this, or 
I don't learn this way. I need to learn a different way or I need additional help. Um, but I think my main takeaway from all this is, is advocacy, whether that's on the parent front or student front. Yeah. I mean, it might feel annoying now when your child is advocating for more eggs, <laughs> egos. Uh-huh. But that turns into like them being able to stand up for what they need and knowing what they need and not um, silencing their voices so early on. So it's a muscle that needs to be to be worked on, even though it's annoying probably at the age of four. <laughs> I was probably very annoying, but I think even me growing up, I, I mean, I had older parents and my grandparents lived with me and um, I we would be like, okay, well, what do you want? for your birthday. Like, why do you feel like you need these items? Like I, it was almost like a presentation that we had to wow. my sister and I. Um, I'll never forget when I asked for Ugg boots when I went to Michigan State. My grandfather was like, well, what's so special about these boots? Cause at this point they're like $200. Yeah. And I'm like, well, these are the features of the boot. Like the inside has this lining because they, they you really had to sell them on stuff. It's like, you want to go outside? Okay, you need to do your chores. It's like, what are the chores you're going to do to ensure you've done this to be able to be rewarded to go outside? Um, Early on, my mother was like, oh, you want those pair of shoes? You need to call around to every footlocker to see if they have your size. I'm not driving from store to store. So very early (laughs) on, okay, look in the white pages. Okay. What's the footlocker on this street? Okay. I know my mom will drive there. Let me call this. Hi. You have to learn how to advocate for yourself early on, ask questions and be able to speak up for yourself. Or in this world, you're not, you're just literally not going to survive. No, no, you're absolutely not. And again, even the fact that you went through the white pages to find the shoe that has a, or to find the store that has the shoe and the size that you need. And that's also instilled in you that work ethic that you're, you're talking about. So they, I mean, there's a method to the madness now. <laughs> it is, it is. And I think I got in trouble for talking so much as a kid. Like that was my citizenship always on my report card. Tiffany is a joy to have, but however, sometimes she talks too much, but she got an A. And look so at us now. Look at us look now. At us now. <laughs> we talk for a living, basically. We talk a lot. <laughs> so I, I, go ahead. it's something to be said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there definitely is. And I also wanted to highlight the importance of parents advocating for their children. I mean, there's multiple reasons why your, your story really resonates with me personally. I mean, my mother is a special education teacher. From the day I was born, she was already a special education teacher. And my brother is um, has mental, I, I, we called it autism, but I think, I don't know if that's still the correct terminology. Okay. He's autistic. And so I grew up around like going to my mother's private school where she was a teacher that was focused solely on providing services to those with mental and physical disability. Um, so this is like everything that you're doing. Uh, it's like, I, 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 I love it. I mean, it, it, there's so much I could, I could get on a platform about it. You'll do a better job than me, but you know, it, it like just, I was the youngest child and it really was my mom pushing my mom pushed for my brother to be a part of certain programs. My mom, like, I remember she went to the courts in regards to like making sure my brother got access to certain services. Like, um, it really, I mean, and you know, it's, it's her pain and her love and it's our pain and our love as well. But, um, I, I have to just like double down on like the parents being the advocate. Um, and I mean, the great thing is, I mean, my brother's almost 50 years old, but there has been so much research looking at you that has done uh, that has been done about like supporting and the learning and just really caring for people with disabilities that didn't exist when my brother was growing up didn't even really exist when I was growing up so I always am curious in the back of my mind like what if he was born in 2022 like what could we have done so there's a lot more out there now that that didn't exist before yeah there's a lot out there but I also feel like the space for when they talk about students and disabilities, it's often very white. And mm. I think 
Um, although statistically in our district, like if we are serving, you know, most of the students with disabilities are students of color. So our black and Latino students are leading um, in terms of uh, the metrics. But I think when people have conversations about disability, even in the mainstream, even as uh, even if a black parent wanted to look up the experiences or connecting with other parents for students, well, their child may be on the autism spectrum as well. It's often so white. It's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. a lot of times there are people, there aren't people in this space that look like you. And I think so often for families of color, uh, it's something that we hide secret. Like we don't want to say that it, our child is different in some way. Um, but there is a power in storytelling and showing up and different people at the table in certain spaces because it makes you feel like you're not alone. Yeah. Um, but so often when you go to these disability advocacy places, it is white people championing for mm. dis- you know advocacy in terms of students' disabilities when there are so many of uh, students of color who, who are in those seats. And um, I just feel like sometimes our parents, our families' voices aren't really heard there. They're just silent in that space sometimes um, because, you know, we may not have the flexibility to get involved like some of the other folks because, you know, everybody's economic circumstances are different. Yeah. Um, and some of these people are meeting at, you know, 12 o'clock on a Tuesday. Well, most people are at work. Um, so I think it, um, there's just a, such a really big space, I think, still there for having an opportunity for our parents um, of diverse backgrounds, really being able to come together and notice that there are other families who look like them who are maybe experiencing similar things. So if there's a parent right now that's listening that does have a child with disabilities, what would be your advice to them as they are either in school or about to enter into like the public school system? Um, really get clear on what your rights are as a parent. Um, every single meeting, you should be getting some type of procedural safeguards, whether it's at the start of the school year, you can find that typically on your state's website, your district's website. Um, understand, read it and ask questions and literally be ready to put your things in writing um, Mm -hmm. about what your concerns are and what questions you have and really get to know your school team, um, your special education coordinator or director, um, the head of school, get to know your classroom teacher, the service providers, um, whether your child is getting speech or OT or um, any behavior support really getting to know them very well and making sure they have your best point of contact um, to stay in communication with them. Um, But if you're attending a public school, this is what your tax dollars are put towards. You literally pay these people's salary. So do not let meetings go by that you don't understand what's happening. Um, Ask questions and really follow up with people. If they promise they're gonna do something, Make sure they put that in writing and you hold them to it. You heard it from the doctor herself. Um, let's, just, let's shift back to you. What do you think was the biggest career risk you've taken so far? I mean, I think at the start of my career, I um, went to Michigan State undergrad, lived in East Lansing, and then I just was like, oh, I'm going to move to D.C. Came out here pretty much sight unseen, went on the interview. I was like, yeah, I'm going to move here had no friends here, knew no people here. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna go. Um, I feel like that is the biggest risk. Um, I, it's a meme that's going around now on social media, like the people who move away from their hometown are like, you have a whole different experience. Your life is on a whole different trajectory. And it really truly is. Um, being in this DC area has really truly expounded what it meant to be black for me what I feel like my potential could be in this space um because you didn't always see a lot of middle class black people in Detroit um but I'm living somewhere now that basically has one of the biggest places of black wealth in the entire country um so I will say my biggest risk 
is moving out here um, pretty much with no safety net, um, no savings, um, just literally taking basically a teacher like assistantship job and just going for it. Did you know you wanted to live in D.C. or you just found the opportunity? You're like, let me try that. Let me try it. I Googled the places. I said, oh, okay. It seems like a nice place. It seems like it's Black people there. <laughs> Why do we Let do that? Do <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I mean, because Michigan State was so white, right? I don't, I don't want to lie on that. Like, it's 50,000 people. I think, you know, at that time when I was going there, it may have been 6,000 Black kids. Um, I was tired of living in Michigan and going in restaurants and you're the only Black person. I was like, oh, it looks like Black people live out there. I want to live there. I want to live amongst my people um, because I was just so tired of the, Michigan is one of the most segregated states in America. Um, when you go to Michigan State, Michigan State is right in the middle of the mitten. Um, but Detroit is Southeastern Michigan. So we're all the way at the bottom. And there are people coming from Northern, like there's places that are 12 mile, twelve hours away from Detroit, right? We're all meeting up in the middle. Hmm. And these are people who literally their families have farms and me, Southeastern Michigan girl, Detroit girl meeting up in the middle. And there's some people who literally had never seen black people before hmm. besides what was on BET and MTV. And I was just tired of being in all spaces where it was just so polarizing with race. And I just don't, I know that racism exists out here. I don't want people to think that that's, I'm trying to portray DC as this like utopian environment, but it's very much like, okay, cool. We're pretty much accepting of a lot of different people. You don't get a nasty look when you go into the store. Um, The people are willing to service me in Louis Vuitton if I go. Um, In Detroit, it's like they just walk, you know, follow you around the store. but I, it's a different experience out here um, because they know so many black people do have money. So it's yeah. like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, you can afford to play. Um, I think just the Michigan um, mindset and just like wanting to stay so close to home, I think me breaking away from that um, has really truly changed the trajectory of my life and like even how I see things. Hmm. So taking that risk and you haven't moved back you've been in dc this whole time i've been in dc this whole time yeah so welcome home yeah and getting ready to take another big risk actually can you talk Um, about it um i'm moving to houston by the time you publish this it'll probably be like me moving soon but yeah uh another huge pivot of another place that i never really been before (laughs) Whoa, whoa, but, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, breaking news. I did not know. <laughs> breaking news. What's moving you to Houston? You know, love. Okay, well, then, yeah. Go, girl, go. Love. Do it. But, I mean, it, it's another move. It's like, this risk has panned out for me. And this next one, likely, will, it will, too. It, it'll work because I made it work. Um, there are some people who come out here and they've hated it and they moved back to Michigan. But uh, I've always loved this space and just Black people excelling everywhere. It's not a needle in a haystack kind of place. It's like, oh, you want Black people excelling in what industry? I got a list. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, we're living in abundance and I hadn't grown up seeing that and almost made me feel like in some ways that I couldn't have that. Um, so living out here has definitely brought in my horizons of what my life could be. Yeah. And you don't realize you're in a bubble, um, living in DC or some of these bigger metropolitan areas, because I, I mean, I'm, I've been places and then it surprises me that they're surprised to see black people in like certain establishments. I mean, not necessarily Louis Vuitton, but like it, it's, it surprises me when people are surprised by black excellence. And I'm like, what? Like, this is shocking to you. You don't know what, like, we're around. And so I kind of, we're definitely in a bubble um, here where it's like seeing Black people excel, seeing brown people excel is, 
is every day. Um, but there is plenty of pockets in the world, a lot more pockets in the world where it's just like, it, it's, it's, a, it's still a foreign concept. It's the phenomenon. It's like, what are you girls celebrating? You're out to eat. What are you girls celebrating? <laughs> Like we how we split the checks. Like no. yeah, and it's not nobody birthday. Like we just going out to eat. Yeah, um, we can go to this very nice restaurant and just on a random day, and that's okay. Um, but for some people in some places of the world, it's like oh, they usually aren't here. Wonder yeah. why they're here this time. Yeah. Yeah. And do we need to change our Yelp reviews when none of them come again? (laughs) Okay. So if that wasn't enough, everything that you've already established in your career with your education and coming into DC in 2015, you started policy and fashion and I described it a little bit, but you know, what is policy and fashion all about from your, from your words? Um, For me, policy and fashion is about you know, a boss women looking amazing at work and excelling at work. I always wanted to create this space where um, people who look like me, so like plus size women who look like me, um, be able to be courageous at work, but also be themselves and be authentic and own their personal style, not feel like they have to shrink or only wear black and not really speak up and um, be like this silent participant at work, you can be a young Black woman looking amazing, dressing the part at work, excelling on your job, and that's okay. Um, I think a lot of times when I launched Policy and Fashion, it was this big wave of like plus size influencers, and it's no shade to the, you know, Fashion Novas and Sheens of the world, but like all the influencers were doing were trying on like club dresses. Mm. And I'm like, well, I can't wear that to work. Like, I can't wear this bandu top and like this uh, bodycon dress to work. Like, I want women to feel like you can look cute at work and on the weekend and really trying to build this wardrobe that works for both and not feeling the pressure of like, well, no, there's no one out there in the world who looks like me or you can only dress one kind of way. Um, So that really was the um, basic push behind the foundation behind policy and fashion. And now it does a few things like, yes, you have you you have this large Instagram following, but you're also doing like, I think, some styling as well. Mm, Yeah. So um, I really 2022 goals to really, truly launch that and like help women transform their wardrobes where they have pieces in their closet that they love, um, where they don't feel like they have to hide during the week or on the weekend, that they can show up um, as their authentic self and wear pieces that fit them well and that they feel good wearing. And the policy side of policy and fashion is the educational policy. um, And then play on the area of DC, where the land of policy and we make pretty much all national policy at this point um, on this, uh, in this city. So I felt like that was a a cute play on words. It is, it is. And I I mean, there's a lot to unpack there around policy and fashion, but this, you know, because this work touches on owning your power and style in the workplace. And as you said, especially for like curvier woman, plus size woman, and, you know, how you look matters flat out. Should it matter? No. Does it matter? Yes. Um, and I, I think sometimes we're like, why should it matter? But it, unfortunately it does. And it, it's good to know the game so that you can beat the game. So I always admire people whose personality really comes out in their attire. And you're one of those people. How have you been able to do that? Like, help me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I am someone who's like, you may see me all day, one day wearing all black. You may see me the next day wearing polka dot stripes and like flowers. I really truly wear what I feel at that time. And I am not afraid to take risks. So I have one of my, one of my closest friends, a former coworker. She's like, oh, she's mixing those prints again. She got on polka dots. She got on stripes. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
Not the polka dot and stripes now. <laughs> polka dots and stripes on today. And I'm like, but they match. And I think I'm, you know, I'm taking risk with pattern and color at work. Um, of course, uh, you know, covered and, you know, not necessarily mini skirts and dresses, but I am, you will see me with a leopard shoe on and some red pants. Um, and I think that that is cool. I don't, they have dress pants that are red. Um, so why do I feel like I can't wear them to work? And I feel like um, if I have a presentation coming up at something where I know I want to really truly stand out, um, when you walk up to the front of the room, you want people to be like, oh, she looks nice. Let me hear what she has to say. Um, you have to draw people in with something. And I do think people are like, why? What you wear doesn't matter. I'm a good worker. I know my stuff, my degrees in X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. But when you are in organizations where you may be client facing, yeah. customer facing, whoever the customer may be, you have to look a certain way. Um, or you're going to always be someone that's like, oh, no, you don't have to come to this meeting. You could just type up everything for this meeting. I'll present. Yeah, because if people don't feel like you fit the aesthetics of what they're trying to get across to whatever client that may be, unfortunately, you are going to be left behind. And um, I think that it's important to show who your personality is through a style and dress. And I think DC is just so like gray suit, blue suit, black suit, like everybody kind of looks the same all the time. And I know that people kind of look like that, that work on Capitol Hill, but I also know some girls that have been on Capitol Hill crushing it hmm. um, and wearing their prints and patterns. And I think that it's okay. As long as your clothes fit well, you are fine. I think uh, I want people to own and wear things that make them comfortable. So if you don't like dresses and heels, don't buy dresses and heels. I'm not, I will never advocate to push someone in something that they're not comfortable in. Um, but I do think that finding what you like to wear, understanding your body type and what makes you comfortable and what you wear. Of course, you can't wear sweatpants all the time. That's comfy. Um, but you can't necessarily wear that 100% of the time in the workplace. So really understanding what key pieces you like and ensure they're in your wardrobe and in rotation. So if I want to be more intentional about how I visually show up in my job, where would I start? Um, I think visually, I, I think branding, let me step, take a step back. Branding is the way you look, speak, and how you show up and what mm. other people think about you um, when you leave the room. So that is kind of like what the overall branding has. I see it. I think visually you have to realize, take an audit of what you have, take an audit of what you like to wear um, and start there. If you realize you want to add in more colors, do that. But maybe it's strategic. Maybe you don't want to wear red pants. So maybe you'll wear a red scarf one day, or maybe you wear a red pair of earrings for your pop of color. I don't want people to feel like, oh, Tiffany said, go buy leopard pants or leopard shoes. I'm going to go do it tomorrow. Ease your way into it um, because you may find ways to add personality flair. I wear glasses. So all of my glasses are different colors, different shapes. That's a way that you can show your creativity or show your personal style as well. Yeah, it was it, when I knew I wanted to start Career Safari, I had a moment of like, what do, what do I look like? I mean, this was, I mean, it started as a blog. So I, you know, I went to a close friend of mine that does photography and I'm like, I need pictures that ac actually represent my personality. Cause I looked at my like professional photos at that point. And I mean, still now some of them are like very, like, as you said, black, white, gray. And I'm like, that's not really Wamita. And if I'm building my own thing now, like I need, what do, who am, who am I as a professional outside of the corporate walls? And I mean, I'm still trying to find that out, but I realized like how much of my personality was muted um, to, to fit in. I mean, I, I did do my little things, but I'm like, no, I, if it's now my company, how would I look? How would I carry myself? And that was, that has been a very interesting exercise. Um, 
but I want to talk a little bit because you touched on it when you were talking about like what people say outside of the room. I want to talk about navigating work politics. And I remember leaving college, entering the workforce and having conversations with friends at that time saying like all that education, all that money I just spent, my parents spent on my education. No one taught me how to deal with office politics. (laughs) It took a beat. It took a beat to figure that out. Um, And, you know, as Tiffany's saying, people definitely do talk about you when you leave the room. It's just human nature. People know like, oh my goodness, that person wears the same pants all the time. That person, their hair is never kept. I mean, men and women, this is not just like a a female or a woman thing. Like people take note of your presence, but what are some of the lessons you learned about how to navigate work politics, politics as you moved up or tried to move up in your career? I think the first thing, particularly in DC, is just assume everybody knows everybody. Mm. Um, so when you're talking about someone or someone is referenced, do not assume they don't know who that person is. Um, don't assume that, you know, whether it's your worst enemy or your best friend, just assume that everyone knows everyone. And I think I, I've always said, would just treat everyone with kindness. So the lady that's at the front desk in my office, the people that are down, um, the parking attendant, the security team, you never know when you may need someone. So really just leading um, and being nice to everyone because you never know when you're going to need them. I think some people go into, oh, I want to know who the heavy hitters are, who the heavy, but you really need to think about who's actually steps down from the top person um, and really truly understanding, navigating who are the heavy hitters, but who are the people um, that you need to possibly build relationships to yeah. even make that high level connection. The influencers. So, the influencers. I think it's always being nice to everyone. Um, I always try to lead with listening first before making um statements about things that need to be changed. There's a lot of assumptions about millennials. There's a lot of assumptions about black women, right? Millennials, they think they know everything. They always trying to change something up. Um, So people who are older assume that you discredit their historical knowledge. Hmm. So how do you uh, build rapport with people who may communicate differently than you? Um, And then people who may feel like, well, I've worked here for 30 years. So I know what's going on. Um, How do you have to know how to build relationships with those folks and um, kind of understanding who they are? And that takes listening. You have to understand those folks' pain points. Have someone on my team who she's like, oh, she's so bright and bubbly personality. Um, She probably wants to change everything. She doesn't care what other people think. So I realized anytime I want to pitch something new to our group, I need to go talk to her first because she can be a she can be an early adopter if you let her in first on this is what I was thinking. I would really like to know your feedback. So when I bring it to the larger group, she's not being negative Nancy. She can actually be a champion for yeah. the things, the change that we're trying to make. Um, but that comes through listening. I know that she doesn't like change. So those are things that I've kind of ranked in my mind, but that's coming from getting to know people um, in those spaces and kind of understanding what folks' pain points are. Um, we got people who are data-driven. So, you know, when you speak, you have to have the statistical data. And, you know, this zip code, this is happening to this percent of kids and this percent of kids are black. This percent of kids is Latino. Like you have to come with your data, but you only learn people's pain points from listening in the environment. Yeah. And you're right. It might seem like annoying in the moment where it's like, I can't believe I have to talk to this person, but name a job, name a human structure, (laughs) That doesn't require you having to politic a little bit. Like if you want chicken on Thanksgiving versus turkey or on Christmas or whatever, you know, that special holidays for you. And that's different. You're going to have to talk to people about that. The work environment is just like compounding because there's so much more at stake, but you're absolutely right. And it's like, you do have to do some like talking on the side and 
well, literally politicking around some ideas that you you want to get past? It's the consensus building. So um, DC is a very political place. So I feel like, but I also feel like that is you how you have to play in certain arenas everywhere. Um, and I think you have to be aware of the people who are the Debbie Downers. Oh, I hate this place. This place is terrible, blah, blah, blah. Because that energy will jump off to you um, yeah. as much as you're like, oh, no. You steadily talking to that person, continuing to um, conversate with that person, those vibes jump onto you. Um, and then the people who are constantly gossiping. Um, there's a way to navigate that. Like, oh, girl, you see that? It's like, hey, girl, how you doing? As soon as they get the gossip, you know what? I got a meeting. I gotta <laughs> Let me run to the bathroom. I'm supposed to run and go get my coffee because I got something else to do. Just you could be pleasant, but as soon as they get to talking about people, oh, you know what? I got to find some, you know, I'm late for this. Let me hurry on off to that um, because you don't ever want to be in a situation where it's just workplace drama. Of, she yeah. was talking about me. I don't think she liked me which unfortunately happens. And I feel like um, then, you know, this people may not like my position, but I think women are also the leaders in a lot of that as well. Mm. Unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. Enough said. <laughs> you, so you mentioned um, people telling you, Tiffany, you are out of time. Like what's the rush? And some of that talk, and correct me if I'm wrong, did some of that talk inspire you to get your doctorate? Yeah, because I feel like as a young person, people are always like, oh, she doesn't know much. Oh, she doesn't know much. So I'm just like, how much more of an expert can I be if I'm like a whole doctor? Uh, <laughs> I think- You really went in like, there. You're like, you know what? You think, I <laughs> come back yeah, and-, and I just think that sometimes it's a struggle because um, people are always challenging your intelligence and people will assume that, oh, it's the white man that's doing it. It's not. Often in my experience, it's been um, black women and women in general doing more of the questioning of like, oh, she doesn't um, know this or maybe she isn't experienced enough to be in this space or that space. And we are often holding ourselves down. Um, and that's been in my experience and even from my research and the participants who I, you know, research participants who I interview, like they said similar things that it is often older black women pulling folks mm. down, women in general, pulling people down. Um, and then it's kind of like this quest of like, well, if I go get this degree, then they're going to have to respect me because I have this. Um, or if I could go get this certification, they're going to have to respect me because I'm going to have this now and I'll have this and that. But unfortunately, some people will always find something wrong with you or always feel the need for you to sit back. So people are like, oh, you're so ambitious. You have time. You're young. Um, why do you need to make all that money? You're young. Um, and I think Oprah said it best when she found out that her other co-anchor was making all this money more than yeah. she was. And she's like, I just ever raised because he's getting, you know, he's making X, Y, Z money. Oh, you're young. You don't have like, why do you need all that money? You don't need all that money. You're a young girl. You don't have any kids. You're just young. You don't need all that money. Um, but black women do need all that money in particular because often we have the most student loan debt as we keep striving to, certify ourselves in comparison to other people we are le left with this large amount of debt that we have to pay for yeah so we need to make sure our salaries align to be able to pay those people yep um so i do think that there are spaces where you know it's a very much pay your dues place um but you know at this point i'm not totally early career I would say I'm mid-career at this point sure. mm -hmm. and I have made some traction and some gains and I do know some stuff but there are always going to be naysayers unfortunately and that's just it's about how long you want to endure that before maybe you move on to a space that is um, more nurturing and welcoming to who you are 
so you said you did research on like the relationship of uh, or like the dynamics between older black women in the workforce, or is that something that you're and, and younger black women in the workforce? That was something that you just happened to like research or that was like part of like your dissertation? Um, that's something that came out of my research. So I will say I looked at the intersectionality of age, race and gender as it related to African-American millennial women's career advancement. Um, and from talking to women, I asked like, what, what is the thing that you feel like is holding you back from making it? Is it race? Is it your age? Is it your gender? And people are like, well, I feel like my company is making a lot of gains in the gender front in terms of like diversity. Um, a lot of times it is a racial thing, but then sometimes they felt this kind of compacting intersection of all three um, showing up as a young black woman in a space where older black women maybe have been there for years and never got promotions. So then they're looking at you like, well, there is not enough space for both of us to exist. Mm. Um, the competition between white women and black women um, in the uh, in organizations. And then also this quest for elevating in organizations where typically the people of color are kind of the bottom level of the analyst or the secretaries and never really moving up to managerial or even more senior level positions. And you just literally saw no black person yeah. um, in higher level positions. So then some of my research participants are thinking, well, do they even hire black people? <laughs> do you start thinking at higher level positions? Do they even want black people? Because it was almost like a clear ceiling of where black people just didn't advance beyond that. Mm. Um, and I think some of my outcomes for my research really focused on workplaces changing that workplace culture where they feel like all generations can be nurtured in a space where uh, the baby boomers and the millennials actually kind of learn how to work through their different work styles and yeah. challenges that exist, but also creating spaces for women to feel um, supported. So whether that's through their leave policy in terms of um, maternity leave or family leave, and then also looking at it as making sure visually your <laughs> higher level organizations have people of color in it. Yeah. Um, so what yeah. are you going to develop the pipeline of talent um, so they don't get so frustrated with being looked over, passed over year after year for promotions. Um, so I, there is a lot to be said about um, the recruitment, the retention, um, and the promotion of Black people, particularly Black women and organizations. Um, and millennials aren't going to stay long in a job where they feel like they're continuously being looked over. For sure. Um, so I think there's a lot of work for organizations to do to make it seem, to make some type of sense of we care about you, we feel like you belong here, and we want to advance you within mm -hmm. our organization. Um, so I think a lot of my work moving forward is going to be focused on improving workplace cultures and making sure spaces are carved out for uh, diverse people. Well, that actually led quite nicely into one of my last questions. So what's next for you and policy, I mean, policy and fashion? I know you're moving to Houston for love, but like what else is coming? What should we expect? Um, I think, well, I know uh, transitioning out of the education space and really truly moving into the diversity and equity, inclusion and belonging space, working with organizations um, to improve their workplace culture. Um, still doing my influencing, more career tips, more fashion tips, um, styling sessions or one-on-one -on -one sessions with clients, um, events. These are all the things that I want to put forward out into the world 2022 and beyond. Oh, I think, I think we're at the um, next level of where T Dr. Tiffany's going to head. Like, I think you, you hit it and now you have a whole nother 
mountain peak to climb. So I can't wait to see you on this next phase of your career journey. Um, sounds really exciting. So Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us. That is our torchbearer for the month, Tiffany Ingram. Tiffany, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they find you? Find me at that's um, Policy and Fashion on Instagram and policyandfashion.com. Awesome. And for more information on Career Safari and to read about her journey, visit us at www.thecareersafari.com and join our Torch community. Follow us on social media. Follow us on YouTube now. Remember that we are now officially a YouTube channel so you can see this interview and all the weird faces I'm making along the way. But until then, continue to pass the torch. Bye, everyone.